Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. So far, President Joe Biden has drawn a red line about direct military confrontation with Russia. But as the war in Ukraine rages on, is America going to change the definition of red? Let's get to the bottom line. As of right now, there's no end in sight to the fighting in Ukraine. We're seeing the horror of war in real time, with all its human rights violations and the grueling, bloody reality on our big screens and our small screens. In the past three weeks, more than three million Ukrainians have fled to neighboring countries. Talks for a ceasefire between Ukrainian and Russian negotiators do go on, but so does the warfare. The U.S. and the European Union support Ukraine, but they refuse to enter the war directly. And President Joe Biden assumes that there's really zero appetite among Americans for war. That said, anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, real-time intelligence, and other weapons and supplies and support are still flowing from the West to Ukraine. There are massive sanctions against Russia, but American officials still want to avoid two totally separate economic groups in the world, one led by Washington and the other by China and Russia. In this situation, Escalation is easier than many want to believe, and that potential for escalation could be exactly the deterrence that affects Putin's course. So will Biden succeed at keeping the war at arm's length, or will the U.S. find itself drawn in as the only way to block Russia's expansion? Today we're talking with Ian Bremmer, the president and founder of the Eurasia Group, a global research firm that focuses on political risk. His latest book, The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World, comes out in May. And Margaret Peterlin, who served at the U.S. State Department as chief of staff to former Secretary Rex Tillerson and now teaches law at George Mason University, really glad to have you both with us. Ian, let me uh, start with you. I want to show you a tweet here. Uh, it's from President Biden. He has tweeted out, we will make sure Ukraine has weapons to defend against the invading Russian force. We will send money and food and aid to save Ukrainian lives. We will welcome Ukrainian refugees with open arms. My question to you is, you look forward and you see the likely scenarios. This is the United States president saying, here are the, here are the areas of where we're going to provide support, where we're going to be engaged. There's a lot not said. What are the most likely scenarios you see as we look forward from this point out? Well, the interesting point uh, is that compared to all the crises you and I talk about, Steve, uh, this is the one that so far, at least, there's been the most general agreement across the political spectrum in the United States. I mean, both Democrats and Republicans in Congress largely agree that you want diplomacy to succeed, but you need to, as strongly as possible, uh, be willing to hit the Russian economy hard if they are not willing to back away from their invasion in Ukraine. You want it to be multilateral. You want it to truly be a consolidated policy with all of NATO allies on board, very much unlike the way that Biden orchestrated the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, you also want to provide as much capacity for the Ukrainians to defend themselves as possible without bringing them into NATO, without providing direct troops for the Americans to defend Ukraine, without doing anything that potentially brings American troops directly into fighting against Russia. So, frankly, I mean, no matter where this goes going forward, that has been the policy. The big question we have, of course, is how Putin responds, given that anything he does is going to put him in markedly worse position politically, economically, and in terms of national security than if he had never chosen to invade Ukraine in the first place. This is not a Biden problem. This is a Putin problem. Ian, you talk to some of the world's most powerful people. You talk to oligarchs. You know Russian strategists and thinkers and academics and officials in the government. Um, we see the Russian economy crippled, and we see regular Russians, because I, I, I know some as well, really feeling this. What are they telling you about Putin's choices, how he's feeling this? Um, it, 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 do you get a sense that there's any effect here that matters? Well, a lot of them are leaving. I mean, you know, if you're a Russian and you had a good job that just got shut down in the tech sector, the finance sector, and you have the ability to get out of the country, you're getting out of Dodge. We're focusing, of course, on the three million Ukrainians that are refugees, and that is the human story. But the fact is that the Russian economy is going to be crippled both by the sanctions and the knock-on effects of the sanctions. Now, I, I would not say that any of this is likely to bring down Putin in the near term. I mean, in the United States, in the same way that 70 percent of Trump supporters actually believe he won the election because that's the base, Putin's base is the entire country in Russia, and 70 percent of Russians actually believe that this war was basically instigated by the Ukrainians and by NATO, and anything that's happening in the Russian economy is their fault, is our fault. They do believe that. 
But there's no question that this economy is getting crippled because of decisions that are made by Putin. There will be more demonstrations on the streets. So far, they've been mostly nonviolent. There's been about 15,000 Russians that have been detained. Those numbers are going way up, and Putin can't be happy about that. Margaret Peterlin, I um, have been looking in this, you know, talking to many analysts who put the red lines about what America and its NATO allies should do in a different place. You wrote a piece that was very powerful uh, in, in a place called The Skiff, and the title was Every Minute We Fail to Act in Ukraine is Another Minute We Get Dragged into a Worsening War. And, and so you're, I get the sense that you're not satisfied with the steps forward from the Biden team yet. What do you think are the right policy uh, actions now? Well, I have some satisfaction with some of the things that the Biden administration has been doing. I think it's great, and I agree with Ian. This should be a multilateral response. And so I think all of those steps are useful. I think that there needs to be an acceleration. I think that the decision about uh, not supporting the transfer of the MiG should be revisited. And I want to explain So let's, why. Tell, let's tell the audience what they The transfer of the MiG fighters from Poland. Yes. That Poland delivered to a NATO base. And the United States originally looked enthused about that and then said, no deal. Yeah. So I think diplomatically there was probably a quieter way to accomplish this. And I think sort of the public negotiation inside the coalition was probably not helpful to getting the MiGs delivered. But I want to talk about the, the on-the-ground experience. Russia has about 772 fighter jets. The Ukraine has less than 10 percent of that. They had about 69. Air superiority has been important since 100 years. And so it, when you listen to what Zelensky is asking for, he's asking for either a no-fly zone or he's asking for help in air superiority. That's anti-aircraft missiles for the high-flying bombers and in addition to the anti-artillery that we've been giving. So I think that there are still tactical, significant uh, support that the United States can provide, and I think the MiGs are an example of it. 28 MiGs is a 40 percent increase in air power for the Ukrainian people. Ian, I, I'd love to get your sense of that, because when we were debating this question about Poland's role, these MiGs, you know, the United States doesn't make these MiGs. These are Russian-really-made planes, I guess, that have been in their arsenal. And I think part of the question is, you know, what looks like NATO involvement, what doesn't? Why is an anti-tank Stinger missile that is flown over and given Ukraine any different than a piece of equipment that flies in the air by a Ukrainian pilot? Look, there was an active debate um, inside the Biden administration, inside the highest levels of the White House, as to whether or not those MiGs would be provided, would be supported. I agree with Margaret that it's not useful to have that diplomacy publicly. This was one of the few missteps that the alliance together has had. Another one was when Macron, the French president, called Putin and didn't tell Biden or anyone else he was going to in advance. There are a couple of points of that where there have been mistakes. But, I mean, compared to the Afghanistan, I mean, th this is like a different administration. It's an A- minus compared to a D. Mm. Um, so, I mean, let's be clear that you have to find exceptions to where the alliance has not been acting in coordinated fashion, given the level of defensive support that has been provided to Ukraine given the extraordinary amount of intelligence support that's been provided as to the disposition of Russian forces on the ground, given the extraordinary and unity uh, of the sanctions, the economic sanctions that we've seen. My understanding specifically on the MiGs is that there were a lot of people inside the White House that believed that those MiGs would never fly, that the level of Russian air superiority meant that you could send them, they'd have symbolic importance because you're giving Zelensky what he wants, but it wouldn't have mattered um, to the disposition of forces on the ground, wouldn't have helped the Ukrainians much. Look, I'm not a defense expert. I'm not going to weigh in on that. What I am going to say is that right now you have three East European heads of state that are visiting Kiev to support President Zelensky while it's being bombed. That's extraordinary. Hmm. And the reason that that is possible three weeks into the war is because of the uni unified and strong NATO response. It never would have been possible if it hadn't been for that. And that creates an opportunity for more people to go to Kiev, for more symbolic support, to help demand that a ceasefire, at least for Kiev, be implemented. That's a level of leverage that has been directly facilitated by a combined U.S., EU, NATO policy, and thank God for that. Margaret, um, another dimension of your article uh, that I found fascinating, I happen to be reading a biography of Churchill 
uh, and then, uh, you know, on my nightstand, picked up your article and read it and said, wow, this is a Churchillian perspective. And I remember that Churchill was doubted uh, in his time, that in the United States, those that were thinking about the need of American engagement before, you know, during World War II was doubted by a significant... We have a... You know, both of you had said there's been a strong bipartisan leadership response, largely supportive of each other, but that doesn't really encapsulate the whole picture, that we have a number of Americans that don't care about Ukraine, that don't see benefits to being engaged in the world. How seriously do you take that? And as someone who worked uh, for Republican administration, several Republican administration, what do you think needs to happen among Republicans, uh, if anything, to reinforce the notion that being engaged in these issues like Ukraine today really matter to the future of this country? Well, I think one is to remember that it's ahistorical to suggest that we're not engaged with Ukraine. So when the USSR fell, it was 1990. At that time, Ukraine had the, third, the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. They had 1,200 nuclear warheads. The United States was heavily engaged diplomatically and at the highest levels in convincing Ukraine to return those warheads to Russia so that they could be discarded. And at the time, we gave them security assistance, about $175 million. And so my view is that it's one thing to formalistically say Ukraine is not in NATO. There isn't that piece of paper. But in some ways, there's a little bit of a common law marriage between us. Mm. And that's not just a Westphalian comment about democracies. It's a comment about our role in convincing Ukraine to give up those nuclear warheads, our role in giving them security assistance at the time, our role in accepting Ukrainian troops in the Afghanistan war. So these aren't people we've never seen at the party before. Mm. And so my own view, and, and I, I appreciate the, the, the comparison to Churchill, I, I have to confess I don't hold my liquor as well as he does, <laughs> but um, I do think that the United States needs to acknowledge that we have been engaged with Ukraine, and it would be ahistorical to suggest anything else. Um, you, something you wrote recently, Ian, that was powerful for me was, you know, some of the myths about this, some of the things that will not happen, not just will. One of them said is that, you know, a nuclear exchange is highly unlikely to happen. Uh, there were various other dimensions of direct NATO involvement, highly likely not to happen. I, I'd love to get your list of things that you think that maybe we in the media are mischaracterizing or hyping in ways that we should be more cautious about as we approach this. Because, you know, I, I have been trying to ask myself and having to reassess, actually, you know, some of what I thought was possible in an encounter like this is the kind of thing I expected Russia to be the best in the world at hybrid war, little green men, cyber takedowns. Turns out we're watching this play in a very, very different way. Um, what are some of the bubbles you think we need to burst in our discussion? I'll answer that, but first I want to respond to Margaret's uh, very good point uh, on the level of commitment the Americans did have historically to Ukraine. We're talking about the Budapest Memorandum, 1994. They got rid of their nukes. The Americans, the UK, and the Russians all committed to support Ukrainian territorial integrity. The Russians have obviously ripped that up even more than the Americans did starting back in 2014 when they took Crimea and pieces of Ukraine. But the Americans have pretended that there's no importance to that. That's a problem. And I think going forward, we have a bigger problem, which is that in Europe, the Europeans actually believe, correctly in my view, that this invasion of Ukraine, a country of 44 million people, um, is, is actually an existential threat to democracy, broadly speaking. I think the Americans do not feel that way. I think the Americans feel like this is a threat to Ukrainian democracy. And the danger is, as we get close to American midterms, as we get close to the 2024 elections, that the Americans start focusing again, inwardly, on it's Biden's fault. Trump is coming back as the president. We can't be committing to Europeans. We're focused on the United States. We're not having refugees here. This isn't our problem. And if that happens, existentially, the mm. transatlantic alliance is far, far more vulnerable. But you're right, Steve. There are things that aren't happening here. The cyber attacks that aren't happening, I think, aren't happening not because the Russians have no capability, but because so far they don't have much targeted capability. So when they use the big malware to hit Ukraine the last time, the not Petya attacks, they hit Ukraine really good, but it also affected a whole bunch of Western assets. 
It almost, for example, brought Maersk, the shipping company, into bankruptcy. And my belief is that the reason that you haven't seen those attacks so far is because the Russians have been careful about not widening the aperture to hit NATO countries directly. The more that Russia takes a hit, the more that this feels existential for Russia, the more they'll be willing to swing at those countries. You've seen one American citizen, a female professional basketball player, um, arrested on a trumped-up charge um, in Russia. How many more of those might we see for NATO countries? How many citizens of NATO countries would be arrested, would be sent to jail, would be potentially even tortured? We've seen that in China with the two Michaels from Canada, absolutely a risk with Russia. What about mm. disinformation going forward that they've done with the Brexit uh, referendum or with the French elections or the American elections? That's going to come back with a vengeance. So there are lots of hybrid issues of warfare that the Russians historically have used against NATO that one would expect in this environment Putin would be willing to do yet again. Well, thank you for that. Margaret and, and Ian, I want to ask you both something. And I, I don't know how to frame it of this. I might get it kind of wrong, which is, you know, sometimes can we afford our principles? When you look at oil and gas, you look at dollars, and you look at also human rights and, and democracy in the world, and you kind of look at the mix of all of those, I see us today warming up here and there to Venezuela. Uh, we're trying to warm up uh, to Iran, which is, of course, another major oil producer. But oil and energy and gas really do matter in the world. You know, some, some cannot take the strident uh, steps that maybe the United States is because of their dependencies. Um, and there's another side. We've kind of been looking at sanctions and the economic impact. So I guess my question is, at a time where we have the Iran deal in the wings, you know, sitting maybe coming back, maybe not, you've got uh, tensions with Venezuela out there, we have... China sitting in this kind of interesting tightrope walk between its interests. What do we have to do with these other problem countries to actually uh, contain our challenge with Russia? Or do you think America and the West are okay and can take on everybody at the same time? So I'm happy to go first. I'll be interested in, uh, in Ian's response. I, I don't think it's a matter of us taking on everybody at the same time. So I want to I wanna argue a little bit with that question. And that's because we are a nation with alliances. We have the World War II, post-World War II alliance system to connect to. It's why the United States had concerns about the Nordstrom II deal and why the pipeline that the Germans were much more comfortable with than the United States was comfortable with was seen as a strategic error. So I do think energy... Um, reliance is a global concern, and it's also a geopol geopolitical concern. But I think the United States is in a place where we are starting to better understand that we need to manage that globally. And so I think that there are solutions that we've talked about. The Trans-Caspian Pipeline is mm. one of them. So I don't think we have to take them all on in the same way. Um, and I, I think that what we're seeing, and I want to address the, the sanctions connection and the energy connection, I agree. There have been unprecedented sanctions in a period of time that is impressive. My, um, the information I have was that we're about a 70 percent cutoff of the Russian economy. Hmm. That needs to go higher. If we want to withhold um, direct military engagement, then I think we need to full throttle the sanctions. So I think we need to move up from luxury goods and vodka to, to really encourage Europe to make the kinds of decisions that the U.K. is, and that is getting out of Russian energy now. Thank, thank you. For that. Ian, I'd love to get your response to that as well. I know you think about yeah. um, these traded commodities in the world and how, you know, the, 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 the gas and energy picture is also one that has to be solved. How do you think the Biden administration is doing on that, number two? But what are the new yeah. ripple effects that we're going to have to take into account, you know, as we look at some of these right. other parties? So I think it's more important to maintain complete unity of NATO on this, uh, even if the level of sanctions are a small bit less, than to have the Americans go well ahead of the Europeans and lose a bunch of the Europeans in the process. There's obviously a balance between the two. You'd like to get both if you can, but if you can't with dozens of countries, um, I err in favor of complete unity, and I think that's where they've been going so far. Now, it's true that under Bush, under Obama, uh, under Trump and under Biden, They've been pushing, pushing, pushing so hard to get the Europeans to spend more on defense, particularly the Germans. By the way, the Germans not only are now moving towards 2% of GDP defense spend, thank you, not Biden, thank you, not Trump, but thank you, Putin, but also they're the ones that are taking 
far more economic pain because they're the ones that were so dependent and are so dependent on the Russian economy. And they're doing that willingly, proactively, because they understand the direct threat of Russia. That's what collective security is all about. I don't hear anyone in the United States complaining that the Europeans are taking more economic pain than the Americans are hmm. because of the sanctions. That's a sign of a good and durable alliance. Now, on Iran, I don't think there's much to look at here because Trump pulled unilaterally out of the uh, Iranian nuclear deal. Biden's wanted to get back in it from day one. They're still trying to make that happen. If it happens, it's basically the same deal it used to be. Russia's trying to stop it from happening, but even the Chinese don't like those high energy prices. Better than even chance that the same old deal comes back. Venezuela, I think, is a mistake by Biden. Mm. It's taken a long time to get the entire group of Latin American governments to work together and refuse to recognize an illegitimate dictator and Mr. Maduro running that country. Right. You're now sending a high-level delegation to talk to him, maybe to get a couple hundred thousand barrels of oil a day back on track. I wouldn't do it personally. But right now, the Americans see this as the top priority is Russia, and anything they can do to get other oil on the market is something they're trying to get done. Real quick question to both of you. Does China pick Russia as its long-term partner, or does China pick the West if it has to make a choice? Okay. Ian? I'll, I'll take this one for sure. Um, China picks Russia because Xi Jinping has already picked Russia, and that country is run by one person, and he would have to completely flip-flop to, to, to change that. I don't think that's going to happen. But China does not want to be tied to Russia in a Cold War that decouples their economy from the advanced industrial economies, the G7. So they are going to try very carefully to avoid that. Yesterday, you had seven hours, hmm. Jake Sullivan, National Security Council advisor, with J Yang, uh, J Yang Jiechi uh, from his counterpart in China. If very little readout on that meeting. Right. In the next few days, I would expect an announcement of a Biden-Xi video call. If that happens, we're on track to try to keep this stable. If it right. doesn't, that's very bad news. Uh, Morgan, I'm going to give you the last word on China's choices. Which way is China going to go? I agree with Ian. I would make one small amendment. China picked Russia, but Russia should know China picks China alone. Mm. And so I don't think that there is an alliance there that you can expect. Uh, I always say, supreme leaders have a hard time working with one another. <laughs> they don't flock. Right. Uh, well, I want to thank you both. Ian Bremer, founder and president of the Eurasia Group, and Margaret Peterlin, former State Department official and current assistant professor of law at George Mason University. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Good to see you. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? It's easy to believe that this is just a war between two countries, with just mostly emotional effects and some economic effects on the rest of the world. But what's on the battlefield now is the future of the world order. For starters, what happens to the idea of the nation state? Putin has actually threatened to erase the lines of a whole nation. Is that going to stand? What happens if he largely gets away with it? What will stability in the world look like then in the future? I don't buy the hype of some American media that talk about the imminence of nuclear war, but this is really a time of huge risk. One mistake on the ground or in the air could lead to unpredictable escalation with really deadly outcomes. And even the best outcomes, in this case, are going to be horrible. Missiles don't have to be falling on our buildings down the street for us to realize that what's going on in Europe now will affect us all for years to come. This really matters, folks. And that's the bottom line.